All right, guys, welcome to the middleware panel of the Multi-Chain Infrastructure Summit 2022. Um, today, I'm joined by four incredible founders um, building uh, middleware for our applications and organizations. And I'm excited to talk us through um, what they're building and uh, the things that the, the decisions they wrestle with um, every day. Um, and uh, just to kick us off, we'd love to introduce um, uh, our panelists here. Um, there's uh, David from Lyft Protocol, uh, Harrison from Bleak, um, Yannick, and uh, yeah, um, uh, Paul from Notify. Hey guys, how are you doing? Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so glad to be here. Thanks, Emerson. <laughs> all right. All right. Um, yeah, David, maybe perhaps you can kick us off. Um, tell us, you know, who you are, what you're building, um, and perhaps one favorite use case of Lit, Lit Protocol right now. Absolutely. Uh, so, yeah, uh, as Emerson mentioned, I'm one of the co-founders at Lit Protocol. Uh, what Lit functionally is, is a decentralized uh, key network that does key management. And the service that is offered on top of that decentralized key, and we can go into some of the details about how that works with multi-party computation and threshold cryptography in a little bit. But functionally, the services that developers are able to use with this key store is uh, programmable encryption and programmable signing. So for a Web2 analogy, basically, you can think about this as like a serverless function plus a key management store, but that's distributed and fault tolerant. Um, and so as mentioned, there's kind of just as there is with any asymmetric key pair, there's two core services with this uh, product, which are encryption and signing. Um, on the encryption side, uh, one of the most exciting use cases is the use of this technology in Web3 social media. Uh, so products like Lens Protocol and Orbis use Lit for token-gated chat and token-gated posts and content. And what's really cool here is that those chats and that content is stored on the open web in systems like IPFS, RV, Filecoin, and Ceramic. And then users can perform the decryption when they hold a given NFT or are a member of a certain DAO. So that's on the encryption side. On the programmable signing side, uh, there's a bunch of really, really exciting use cases unfolding, a lot of attention around private key abstraction. That's probably where most of the focus is right now. And so something that, um, that is coming very shortly is the capacity to, for example, have your cell phone and hook up your device key as the party that can authorize a signature from the distributed custody key, and then store that device key in like your Apple password manager and then you could have a situation where you take your phone and chuck it into the ocean, buy a new phone, sign into iCloud, enter your PIN code, revive your device key onto that device, and then just keep using your wallet um, as if kind of you've never lost your phone and nothing ever happened. There's also some other stuff to get into around like DeFi automation and automated rights to systems like Ceramic and Polybase. Uh, but yeah, I would say those are like uh, Web3 Social and, um, and private key abstraction are some of the most exciting things happening um, in the context of this MPC network today. Awesome, awesome. Thanks, David. Dave. And uh, Yannick, why don't you introduce uh, Elusive? Yeah, um, I'm Yannick, I'm one of the co-founders of Elusive and a core developer as well. Um, and what we do at Elusive is we we basically um, we take privacy and combine it with what we call decentralized compliance. So we offer um, a super straightforward privacy SDK to developers to um, integrate privacy into their web apps. Um, into their DeFi applications, their wallets, whatever, um, and combine that with not having to worry about bad actors um, misusing um, this gained privacy on chain um, to uh, for, for illicit reasons, basically. And um, yeah, we can get into the details of how we do that architecturally, but um, it's actually um, going into the direction of uh, of what David described with Lit. So. Um, for privacy, we use zero knowledge proofs, but for compliance, we use multi party zero knowledge proofs. So it's um, basically combining as well threshold cryptography and all kinds of crypto aspects um, yeah, to, to bring together the best of both worlds, I guess. Awesome. Awesome. And from my understand, you also integrate with front ends like, like wallets as well in order to um, prioritize some transactions. Yeah, exactly. So um, that's 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 the really exciting thing um, for us right now. Um, that when we go into mainnet, eventually um, will directly be integrated into a major wallet. So um, right now, starting in the Solana ecosystem, um, and we're there in the wallets. You have the option really with one toggle to be private in your um, base layer on your chain. So 
you can directly um, have your DeFi, um, have your peer-to-peer -peer payments, whatever, um, privately from your wallet. You don't have to go to elusive.io or sign up or anything. It's um, composable in your in your wallet. Yeah. Super, super. All right, uh, Harrison, how about Fleek? Sure. Uh, I'm Harrison, co-founder at Fleek. <clears throat> Today, what people best know Fleek for is kind of a Web3 hosting platform. Um, we host maybe like 40 or 50,000 apps who use us for just hosting their site or their DAP uh, on different Web3 protocols, but mainly IPFS. Um, but what people probably will know Fleek for very soon uh, is that we're now building Fleek Network, which is essentially like a decentralized Cloudflare or like decentralized content and application delivery network. <clears throat> and so really with the current Fleek platform or most other platforms in the space today um, or service providers providing services on top of especially the decentralized uh, storage protocols, mostly everyone is using Cloudflare to accelerate content because it's just too slow uh, to query data from these base layer protocols. And they don't really uh, focus on performant delivery as part of their economic models. And so you're left needing some sort of caching layer uh, because your users need performant delivery and low latency to provide a good user experience that they'll tolerate. Um, and so really, that's the area Fleek Network is aiming to like serve for the Web3 stack is really just accelerating content, starting with static content from these uh, storage networks, but it's agnostic to the underlying layer. So you could even accelerate content from Web2 storage providers, but our focus uh, is on the Web3 ones, but it works for anything. Uh, and then eventually we'll move into more dynamic content uh, where we could accelerate data from some of these data availability protocols or many others, live peer, ceramic, anyone that has data to serve that they want to be served more performantly. Um, and uh, with that, we're building a new version of the Fleet platform. It's uh, way more on the Web3 side of the spectrum versus sort of the Web 2.5 area we sit in right now. Um, and that's got a lot of cool features. Maybe I'll get into more of those on this panel, but um, working on cool things like having all the sites or apps be mutable on-chain NFTs that you can mint or potentially your users can mint. Uh, and that opens a lot of cool possibilities for censorship resistant and alternative access points to these dApps uh, besides just relying on browsers and DNS access. Um, so yeah. Super, super, much needed, definitely. Um, and Paul? Notify. Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Paul. Uh, I am one of the co-founders uh, at Notify. Uh, Notify is what we call colloquially like the Web3 Twilio. Uh, we allow developers and builders uh, to really be their customer engagement uh, tool set uh, to provide communication rails back to where their users live today. Um, so we provide everything from on-chain to off-chain communications. Uh, and we allow basically uh, projects to, to send messages uh, to their users directly uh, in the channels they care about the most, uh, whether it be email or SMS or Telegram, uh, Discord. Uh, but essentially, we see ourselves as a uh, infrastructure service uh, in Web 2.5. And we provide the facilities uh, to provide open communication back and forth from users to the project. So uh, yeah, that's a little bit about us. Awesome, awesome. Thank you. Um, so I see a, a, quite, a, quite a few common trends here, right? Like uh, as middleware, you're building new functionalities like privacy um, into, into front ends like wallets. Um, and uh, I, see, I also see um, a lot of extracting of complexity, like um, messaging, uh, messaging protocols, um, and simplifying access control uh, for developers in Web3 as well. Um, and with these easier experiences, sometimes perhaps brings uh, some points of centralization. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, what are some points of centralization um, that are in your stack? Um, and uh, what made you decide that to bring that off chain and potentially, you know, uh, get that path into decentralization in the future? Uh, maybe uh, David, I can start with you. Yeah, absolutely. It's an excellent question, and I think a very practical one of how new uh, cryptographic and pri kind of privacy technologies enter the world. Um, the main thing for us in terms of what's centralized today, you know, it's November of 2020, is that we have uh, node architecture, um, but we're mm -hmm. currently running all of the nodes uh, with an intention to start decentralizing those in January. And that's largely just because there's a lot of research and development to do. Um, lit, just for a little bit of context, will never be something fully on-chain, given that it's a key management system and you don't want to store those key parts on-chain. 
this is a, a separate uh, piece of decentralized infrastructure that will always be off chain and is in its own process of progressive decentralization. And yeah, the reason to start there, as mentioned, is in the context of, of research and development. So because we're kind of rolling some of our own crypto here in, in terms of cryptography, um, a lot of the, the, the underlying packages that we're leveraging for things like distributed key generation, proactive secret sharing, these are some of the core components that are used. Kind of before we started working on this in the context of building this out as a decentralized network, largely these technologies were used by system administrators in, uh, in, in, in centralized organizations. And oftentimes when you really kind of dig deep into something that's like a distributed database or something that is a decentralized technology, you'll find the notion of a central dealer in the context of how those technologies work. And frankly, a lot of our engineering work has been stripping out that central dealer and implementing smart contract based systems for how the nodes can communicate. And that's just like a, like a non-trivial engineering task and very much our priority to kind of like do that in a safe and secure what, and audited way. Um, but there's certainly a lot of engineering hours that go into stripping out those central dealers and replacing them with distributed systems. And for the reason of having to do that R&D, test things, make sure it works, um, being able to have the nodes run centrally today uh, makes that iteration and product development uh, cycle much more rapid. Got it, got it. So I hear that um, you're keeping the node networks right now centralized so we can have more time in R&D and in order to provide safety for, for the future of the centralized network um, as well. All right, and uh, uh, Yannick? Uh, yeah, so I think um, it makes sense to uh, give you a quick rundown of how the architecture itself looks. Um, so for privacy, we really, um, have the SDK that runs on the client side, um, some, some nodes that, that relay transactions that are decentralized, but don't take over a super important um, role. All they have to do is basically sign a transaction and have some sort of liquidity. Um, and then we have the zero knowledge proof verification that happens on chain. Um, so the system is the ideal uh, system, fully decentralized, um, fully integrated with the chain architecture. Um, then the, isolated um, second part basically which is um, our decentralized compliance network um, that's where we have some some um, centralization of course and trade-offs so um, how it works on a on a um, top-down level is um, with your private transaction infrastructure per zero knowledge proof um, we we output uh, some encrypted data and this encrypted data basically hides what happens in the private transaction. And then the decentralized network, uh, um, like with LIT, uh, using threshold cryptography, is able to uh, vote on, um, on some actors. So they can vote on suspicious actors or on bad actors. And with different um, um, thresholds, with different consensus requirements, um, they're able to vote that the privacy um, of an actor should be reduced, which, which means um, moving, moving the, the actor basically from the main privacy pool to a smaller privacy pool, or the privacy should be fully revoked because it's a bad actor, a hacker, um, and the community doesn't want to provide privacy, privacy to such an actor. Um, and here you, you can really see that this is some sort of, um, of centralization. We have a voting body that in itself is decentralized, but, um, but um, really goes against the mathematical um, privacy we provide with zero knowledge proofs. Um, and so the goal with this is to make it fully decentralized, make it worldwide, and have it be a fall safe system basically for the important cases where globally you have consensus of something like 90% where you say, okay, this is definitely some actor that we shouldn't provide privacy to in our protocol because our privacy protocol should be sustainable, something like this. So that's where we want to go, basically. Great. So certainly now it makes sense to bring the compliance part of chain um, and the, the voting mechanism in itself is also decentralized so to mitigate that. Uh, awesome. So uh, Harrison, um, how, how is, what are the points of centralization area for, for Fleek and uh, what's the path to decentralization? Now? Yeah, <clears throat> on the Fleek network side, they're similar to Lit protocol and how other protocols have gone to market. Uh, there will be a role within the network uh, which are gateway nodes, which are essentially the ones that get the requests and then um, route them to the closest cache node. Um, to start, we'll probably have just sort of trusted parties in kind of like a federated uh, system running those gateway nodes. And it's really just we need more time to understand like how to uh, properly do that in a fully decentralized way to be able to basically measure bandwidth 
um, that they're accu accurately reporting requests back to the network. Um, <clears throat> so that's really the reason for that. And then I'd say the other point of centralization, which is definitely a harder one to avoid, is um, <clears throat> DNS. Just as long as people are using browsers and accessing assets or websites via uh, HTTP and using like DNS URLs, <clears throat> that's a really hard like point of centralization um, and probably going to be one of the last dominoes to fall in terms of like a fully decentralized web. Um, but in two ways we're uh, addressing that. One is uh, for the Web3 storage protocols, like we will have an HTTP option where you give us a link and we could accelerate whatever that content is that that link points to. But for the Web3 storage protocols, we will actually be doing direct integrations where we're querying the data from the networks. So instead of giving us like an IPFS URL from Fleek or Web3 storage or something, we could also then go directly to the network and try to request it that way. Um, same with Filecoin or Arweave or other sources we might add in the future. Um, and also you're seeing changes, like there was a big one that came to Chromium recently where now you can kind of like uh, query alternative uh, things, like it opens up the door for better IPFS direct querying and things like that. So yeah, over time there's new people working on different things that open up new possibilities to do things fully decentralized. So um, yeah, just taking a pragmatic approach and this progressive path to full decentralization um, but not sacrificing too much in order to get a product to market that, you know, is good enough um, and then can work out those details over time. Yeah, certainly, certainly. I hear, I hear a lot of similarities with the, with the lit um, uh, progressive decentralization as well. Um, and yeah, Paul, notify, I, I hear, I think the, firstly, the, the entire platform is, is, is soft chain. Um, but I'm curious, you know, whether um, you're thinking about uh, decentralizing parts of it in the future. Yeah, no, I think for us, it was pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, notifications uh, going back yeah. to like uh, email, SMS are the, you know, the pinnacles of centralization. So there was no if, thens, and buts about it. Uh, it made a lot more sense to support those channels because uh, that's what the users and customers were asking for. Um, so uh, we didn't really think twice about uh, coming up with a decentralized path to eventually hit uh, a text message, right? Um, and also like from a messaging notification perspective, I think the TPS requirements uh, to handle bursts and, and whatnot are just, you know, frankly, just exponentially higher than the current TPS that most of these blockchains can actually support. Um, so it doesn't make too much sense to go down that path uh, as an MVP, right? Um, so we we decided to do it uh, as fast as possible, uh, doing the most like, you know, Web 2, Web 2.5 style. Um, what that means for the future, uh, you know, we're still like thinking about it. Um, you know, in fact, I think a lot of uh, folks have a hypothesis that, you know, communication uh, for just notifications should be decentralized, but uh, we haven't seen any customers or builders uh, really asking for it when it comes down to paying for those messages. Because um, there's always a cost and user experience that they have to go through. So uh, for us, we're taking our time um, and eventually approaching what that looks like in the future. But for the time being, um, you know, finding PMF, uh, you know, solving for real problems is, is, is a bigger urgency for us. Um, yeah. So, yeah. 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 And it's something that I hear from, from other panelists as well. It's, it's, it's go to market adoption first, uh, PMF. And before we take time, while we take time to do R and D, um, in order to find a decentralized path. Um, cool. And, and another, uh, decision perhaps that, that you've been, you were considering while you're building your projects is potentially, um, whether you go to by the plug and play SaaS model or more like a white glove uh, go to market in order to acquire um, more perhaps like big name uh, customers. Um, I'm curious lit to understand much of the access control is quite a uh, white glove. So I'm curious why you, why you opted for that path uh, over some, uh, yeah, uh, maybe plug and play APIs SDKs. Yeah. So, I mean, we have a open source SDK, um, uh, nearly a thousand application developers have installed it. Some we have, like no prior relationship with and people have just started using it because they found out about it through contents and hackathons. So it's a little bit of both. Um, and then there are uh, certain users like Lens, for example, that wanted to do more sophisticated things. Um, so like, as I mentioned, there's this programmatic encryption as well as programmatic signing, uh, which just got launched uh, in developer preview about six weeks ago. Um, so yeah, I mean, we're obviously there to support people who want to kind of leverage this underlying fault tolerant compute and, and, and signing process. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily say we bucket into one of those camps in terms of something yeah. that is self-serve versus kind of white glove. Um, but just 
in the same way that like uh, AWS and Azure and Google Cloud have account reps for people who want to do things more than just the basic use of those um, compute uh, uh, capacities and, and, and are there to support their users. We, of course, are there as well. Um, and some of the most fun and exciting parts of that conversation is introducing somebody to this capacity that may have never heard of it before, such that we can like ideate and jam and uh, some of the, our, our most exciting days are when somebody gets a conception of the capacity that is uh, available with either programmatic encryption or programmatic signing and proposes a, a use case that we have never heard before. And so when that happens, that gets everybody on the team really excited. Nice, nice. Uh, how about Yannick? Uh, yeah. Um, so we also offer SDK. I mean, we are not main yet, but we are offering at some point um, SDKs. So um, on the one side, the privacy SDK um, and on the other side, the compliance SDK. Um, so the privacy SDK is directly integrated in wallets and there it's of course with big names an interactive process where you um, where you have out, where, where you work together um, and the same for the compliance SDK, directly integrating it into block explorers, looking for the needs. Um, since we are not on the market yet, um, for us, it's really um, right now more wild club, more interactive, mm -hmm. more um, designing it um, around the, the customer's need, uh, the customers we work with right now. Um, but eventually, um, once we are alive, I guess it will be fully, um, fully SaaS-like plug and play, mm -hmm. um, directly integratable. And um, that also stems from um, privacy. Um, and the infrastructure itself requiring uniform interactions. So um, the privacy of the of the system is increased if um, everything um, happens with the same kind of transaction, because then you you cannot identify what exactly happened. So if someone builds a private messaging protocol um, on our circuits, then um, the circuits that automatically also do some symmetric encryption of messages would be suitable and um, the user might not actually transfer funds, but um, only transfer messages. So that's why the plug and play approach um, really fits well, I guess. Awesome, awesome. So I see that it's, it's white glove for now, but once you build brand and uh, launch your own product, then um, you'll, you'll progress to the, to the SaaS product instead. Um, all right, and Harrison, Reed, how about Pete? Yeah, I would say we're pretty firmly in the SaaS bucket. Um, <clears throat> the, pr the product was purposefully like, tried to be pretty self-serving. And we on purpose tried to match the experience to like what a Web2 developer would be used to for <clears throat> hosting or with Fleek Network, just a CDN. Um, but I think naturally with every business, you know, you have white glove service for certain marquee customers or partners. Um, but yeah, definitely uh, we try to be more on the self-service. We don't have to talk to customers. They could come yeah. use it and yeah. Right, right. And, and this goes back to the, the abstracting of complexity as well in order to really onboard those web two developers, uh, 2.5 developers that uh, take us targeted from day one. Um, and Paul? Yeah, I think for us, we're in this unique intersection. Uh, we, you know, we started probably around this April. Um, so mm -hmm. we were intentionally a little white glove to begin with, uh, working with a few select partners, uh, early feedback. Uh, we call them like our premier customers or, or kind of like our alpha users. But uh, they helped us uh, to kind of build our product together, platform together. And uh, our journey was to get into more of the self-service capabilities. But, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, yes, we have an SDK, but exactly what do you want to do with the SDK and how do you optimize it for uh, leaving it like almost permissionless? Um, you know, we wanted to be mindful of a couple things. Um, one was making sure that collectively we were building something that could be useful to the wide audience. And, uh, you know, messaging notifications is kind of, uh, you know, it, it could be very generic, but at the same time, it could be very highly specialized and customized. Um, so we kind of left it uh, a little bit in the middle. Um, and as we we're doing like V2 of our SDK, we take our lessons learned and try to kind of homogenize it for everybody. Um, and the other thing that we considered was, uh, you know, what our current pricing model is is that we basically give it out for free uh, for early adoption, early feedback, and iteration. Uh, and that actually means that you know we should be very careful about who we allow people to leverage our systems, right? Because uh, at the end of the day, they do have real life costs and uh, also regulatory and compliance requirements uh, for like GDPR or any kind of like can spam uh, rule. So uh, we were very particular about how self service we could make it. Um, 
and as we're going to the next phase of our like company, um, I think we'll always be a little bit, uh, you know, kind of flirting in between both, uh, keeping, you know, very, very small, but like powerful features, self-serviceable. Um, but I think the more customized implementations, um, you know, the enterprise kind of grade, um, you know, services will keep it a little bit more on the white label side of things. Yeah, and, and I think I hear, hear that from, from all of you that uh, in, in summary, you have like the white, the opt for perhaps a white glove to, in order to like, gain the, the, the early feedback, gain early credibility from, from major customers, and then uh, um, SaaS for more scalable and self serving needs. Um, and there's always room for customization for those large customers you want to acquire as well. Um, and uh, yeah, perhaps now we can move towards like uh, developing that multi network effects, right? Beyond, um, you know, through the use of a token, but more organically, um, right? And and perhaps uh, we can start from David again. Um, well, how what's your plan to attain these and attain these network effects and maintain um, maintain them over the long term? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, there's uh, many many different types of network effects. Um, so, you know, there's like network effects that are a bit called unlikely to be softer network effects that are just like the knowledge that people have and people telling their friends about how a system works. Um, there's the network effects associated with like how the service, like the decentralized network provides the service. Um, but to me, the most interesting network effect of note is that so as part of this uh, distributed custody key, we have something that we call a PKP. It stands for a programmable key pair. Uh, this is a programmable distributed custody wallet. And basically it, it lets you to start thinking about the wallet itself as a place to encode application level logic. What should be signed and when, this is applicable for writing data to off chain, on chain, enterprise use cases, and the, the contracts or applications or functions that any given developer would write to dictate how this distributed custody key would sign, um, those are in public. And so as more and more people use the system, there is a supply of more and more packages, kind of similar to the way that like people like using JavaScript because there's so many available packages on NPM. And so that's where I think really one of the strongest network effects uh, in this project is, which is to say that for every new person that comes in and wants to build something with programmatic signing, um, as time passes, there's more and more kind of open source code for that individual to use in attempting to kind of like accomplish whatever their product directive is. Mm -hmm. It's very cool. It's very cool. So the more people use it, the more the easier it gets for other people. Yeah. And how about Elusive? Um, yeah. So we actually have some um, some interesting network effects right from um, from a technical standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, so the way privacy is achieved is um, on a on a smart contract level when you have a protocol that ends up um, transferring funds out of it um, you would say okay um, what's the identifiability of an actor that's that's your privacy how identifiable is an actor that's one over the number of all um, participants in the protocol in the ideal case and that shows that the more users the protocol has the better the privacy is the more users are attracted. So that's uh, one big network effect itself um, that can be captured. Um, and another interesting network effect that we have based on our technical implementation um, is that because zero knowledge proofs can be verified in batches like we see with, with rollups and, and technology in that area, um, what we can do is we can have in, uh, uh, instant transaction settlement when users want to transact um, and send funds when the network that relays the transactions has some um, enough liquidity, they can provide the liquidity and um, say we'll verify the zero knowledge proofs on chain at a later stage when we have enough to, to be batched together. And so when we have high network throughput, we can use that to um, have instant settlement and fees um, basically at zero because um, we can batch many proofs together. So that's another network effect because the more users, the cheaper it gets, the more attractive it is. Um, and um, yeah, I think um, what's also interesting is that um, 
we the longer your privacy protocol lives um the higher it's it's, it's where you get because you have more users um and um what we can see when we take a look at tornado um is that at a certain size of the network um it most likely collapses when you don't think about compliance because then you have illicit actors that are attracted to the protocol because they can use it for illicit reasons um and so having compliance um really is its own network effect because then you're able to have a long living sustainable privacy protocol that that grows organically um yeah so i i think that's that's most of the um network effects that we want to maintain it's interesting it's interesting and uh, how about fleek um yeah so i'd say one network effect and i have no idea if it's going to play out um but one network effect we are somewhat excited about is when you think about some of what makes web3 like so great it's kind of the transparency you have mm -hmm. with these recent situations and blow ups just being able to see everything on chain things like nansen where you know you see eth gas spiking and you could go see like what nft mint is going on and you know um but that's all for like back end data and we don't really have visibility into the front end of things like request data um and with the promises of web3 and you know decentralized social and kind of what everyone is anticipating is like you separate the data from the interfaces mm -hmm. um so that's good but it's also like how all these interfaces power their user experiences is by using that data to then you know form their algorithms of what content to show you um and so just like imagine if cloudflare's data set was public and you had all that information not just across one interface but many interfaces um we think that fleek network could create a network effect um where projects feel like it would be better to use fleek network versus an alternative because if you can capture a big enough share of the market you would probably want to be in that data set because it might start being used by certain applications as part of an algorithm to determine what type of content to surface because you'd be able to see for an nft a, like almost like a google analytics type page of like okay 60% of the traffic for this viewing this nft is from open sea you know 10% from here and it's coming from this part of the world or it's spiked on this day and you know that's pretty valuable data um and so that is not like it's like potentially an unintended consequence of fleek network and making that data transparent but we're trying to be intentional about it because we do think that could create a pretty cool network effect and a pretty big unlock for the web3 ecosystem um yeah yeah that's that that's that uh, yeah, Paul, how are you thinking about it? Yeah, I think for us, like uh, our, our kind of our thesis is always around like build the right tools for developers uh, to kind of obfuscate away uh, the complexity or kind of like the uh, implementation worries that they have to and kind of the Web2 style of things. Um, so at the end of the day, we're trying to build the best product uh, that gets them to the finish line as quickly as possible. Uh, and I think when uh, you see most of the projects and builders uh, start to have like uh, features that enhance customer experience, um, I think they start to have like a domino effect, right? Uh, for so long, I think notifications and messaging in Web3 were kind of like long forgotten. Uh, it was always kind of like uh, deprioritized. Um, user experience is always at the uh, at the end of the priority list. But uh, I think now uh, what you see, uh, at least you know, even in the last couple of weeks, uh, is that more and more projects want to kind of reach out to their community outside of Discord and and, and uh, Twitter, and uh, they want to re-engage. They want to communicate again uh, and provide updates uh, more. You know, seem like seamlessly, um, and I think that's kind of the main. Uh, 
moat that we're building is that we're trying to advocate for your customers um, as a builder uh, so that you don't have to uh, custom implement or operate and maintain a lot of these uh, investments that you have to do. Uh, so I think that's starting to really uh, compound uh, with a lot of our projects going live. Uh, we started in April with, uh, you know, one integration uh, and we have now 25 um, across three L1s. And I think that trend uh, is ticking up uh, as more and more projects realize that, uh, you know, customer journeys are important and, you know, just general like uh, insurance policies on things that are happening on chain with your with your project is kind of important. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's the mode that we're, we're trying to like really exemplify, uh, you mm -hmm. know, going to hacker houses and really advocating on behalf of their customers um, to kind of elevate their their project a little bit further. Um, in terms of the network effects uh, thereafter, uh, you know, I think we, we take a little bit of a Web2 approach at this, um, you know, kind of doing a page off of Twilio's handbook. Uh, they, mm -hmm. they basically provide a lot of their product services um, to, you know, every single hacker house or hackathon that they could have. And eventually, uh, you know, projects started to understand the, the ease of use, but implementations uh, of what they could provide. So I think we're going to be doing the same thing. Uh, you know, we've been mm -hmm. pretty pretty, uh, you know, available at the Solana hacker houses uh, and promoting with bounties or, you know, different grants uh, to build better UX and UI is something that we're going to probably continue to do. Um, so, yeah, that's a little bit about kind of our plans. Awesome, awesome. And now that we've gone through all, all that, uh, I'd love to point us towards the future um, and uh, perhaps like in, in three years, in the next cycle, um, what's one use case uh, that you're very excited for and hope that can be built on your infrastructure. Yeah, this is the, hopefully it doesn't take three years. So I'll first, I'll start <laughs> with that. Um, so, I mean, I think in the context of basically at the combination of this, this notion of programmatic signing and programmatic encryption, you know, what are the things that we're really excited about? And I'll describe it in a general sense first and then can get more, a bit more specific is basically um, having people be able to have agents like automated applications that govern the use of their sovereign funds and their sovereign data. Uh, so like mm -hmm. an example on the non-financial data side is today the paradigm around data consent and selective disclosure from an individual to an application is mediated through gigantic Web2 conglomerates like Google and Facebook. And what I'm specifically talking about is a world where you go and log into a website with Google and then you get a prompt that says, hey, this website would like access to your context and calendar and you click accept. And then that data is sent from Google to that application via some specific scopes. I think what I'm, what, what I'm kind of getting at here and talking around about like agents that are acting over your, your, your data, at least in this non-financial context, is what that starts to look like more as a first party relationship where the user travels around the web with their own encrypted data store. And I think it remains to be seen whether the user data lives on decentralized web nodes, a la Jack Dorsey and AT protocol, or on systems like Ceramic and Polybase. Um, but wherever the data ends up being stored in earnest, there will be a mechanism uh, where selective disclosure and consent is required, whereby an application can start to um, read data from a user's private data store, and then in turn, write data back to that user's private data store. And so as a result, we start to see a much more networked view of the whole internet where users are traveling around with their own, sometimes people use the metaphor data backpack, and that data backpack is connected to every application that that individual uses and all of their friends. And on the back of that sovereign data and automated rules to govern it, I think that we will see whole new categories of applications emerge on top of that. Mm. For example, like search is a prominent aspect of Web2. Obviously, Google is, you know, is, is, is one of the, the leaders of Web2 and brought Web2, um, uh, you know, like brought Web2 to, to the world uh, in a way. Um, and so I think you can start to really imagine like fundamental applications that are different in the context of an open data web. For example, right now we probably all take our notes in some kind of closed ecosystem, whether it's Notion or Apple Notes or Rome, but it's not too hard to imagine a world where we start taking our notes in an encrypted format on 
systems like uh, IPFS and ceramic, where there's rules, you know, using lit, for example, around selective disclosure and who can read them. And you can start, and what I'm getting at here is you can start to reimagine applications when the user has their own encrypted private data store, such as search. For example, let's say you um, enter a search term like early stage venture capital, and um, instead of just seeing web results, you also see the fact that, oh, Emerson over at Long Hash Ventures has written a bunch of stuff about that. And you have this search bot crawling that in some kind of privacy preserving way. And then all of a sudden you can have like interest graphs and social graphs layered into something as fundamental as search because the data is kind of like in there in a privacy preserving way on the open web. Um, so that'd be like one example of something that gets built on what I'm really excited about seeing, uh, which is, um, users having sovereign data uh, that is controlled by wallets and, and, and encrypted. So kind of uh, embedded into the way that people are interacting with Web3 today. Awesome. awesome. Yeah, I think that's, that's quite a few, um, a few identity projects that I've been talking about. In interoperable identity, bringing from an, one application to another. But it's another thing to selectively di disclose what data you want to release onto the open web. And in, in that sovereign ownership, you own that selection as well in order to what, what you wanted to disclose and what you want. What you yeah, it's an amazing thing. I mean, I guess just to comment on that, like, you know, it's almost like in the web today talking about identity, like you or every given individual has like a different archetype around their identity on any given web platform So you're the business person in LinkedIn, you're the NFT DJ on Twitter, you're yeah. like the cool gardener on Facebook and the fashionista on Instagram, for example. And I think what we can head toward collectively as an industry is a world where rather than your identity being parked or siloed in these various Web2 walled gardens, you as the user, you travel around with multiple identities and you basically mm -hmm. sign in with a given identity. Go, for this website, I'm the gardener. And for this website, I'm the professional. And you go, which mm -hmm. identity do you want to log in with? And, and you basically have those as, as, as your data and then you get to decide who you want to be based on the type of application or individual that you're interacting with. It's very, very interesting. Very interesting. Um, yeah. And Yannick, what could be built on Elusive? Um, yeah, I, I guess I have a, a bit more condensed um, and, and <laughs> concrete answer. Um, so um, for me personally, um, uh, for DeFi in, the, in, in light of, of the recent events, I guess, um, um, I would really like to see an um, accelerated shift from central exchanges to decentralized exchanges. Um, but one hindrance there, um, really, I think, for many users is the lack of privacy. Um, and for private exchanges, we already have private exchanges, but the adoption there um, also um, is not that great, I think, because of um, problems with compliance. So. Um, I would really like to see um, some decentralized exchange that leverages both privacy uh, and decentralized compliance um, to to um, yeah allow for more um, self custody. Mm -hmm. Very timely in these circumstances today. Um, and Harrison. Yeah, I would say. Um... We're, like one big milestone we're looking forward to is when we could potentially convince an existing large web two platform, uh, potentially a video platform. Video is a huge part of the just global bandwidth market. Um, <clears throat> but with these decentralized networks, we do feel, especially decentralized infrastructure, um, just given like the corporate cloud model and how tempting it is to uh, like push up prices, all else equal, to increase profits, um, but also just the human cost of managing infrastructure and the percentage that eats into like the cost of these cloud services. Um, we think not just from a performance perspective, um, but well, that's the harder part uh, when compared to centralized alternatives. Um, we do think we could be as performant or more performant than a Cloudflare. Um, but definitely on the cost side of things, uh, similar to some of the cost discrepancies we're seeing from 
the decentralized storage networks to the cloud storage providers. Uh, we think similarly for bandwidth, we should be magnitudes cheaper than some of the Web2 CDNs. And so we definitely are going to start by servicing the Web3 ecosystem because that's kind of like our bread and butter and who we want to service. Um, but we would like to see in three years if you know we could convince a large yeah maybe not a youtube or a netflix but there's a lot of other big platforms serving a ton of content and um it would be really cool if we could prove that these web these decentralized networks uh could you know and are superior to these web2 alternatives um so that yeah that would be something cool we would love to see yeah Totally would love to see YouTube videos being stored at IPFS. <laughs> yeah. Um, how about Paul? Yeah, I mean, I think we thought about this a few times in terms of like, you know, what does the world look like when you have some sort of interoperable messaging happening? Uh, and I think one of the things that we saw in kind of the market was that, um, you know, in Web2, there's a lot of walled gardens, um, you know, different like centralized like messaging platforms uh, who prohibit uh, the ability for you to send messages to other applications. Right. So you can't send a WhatsApp message to, uh, I don't know, a uh, signal user right mm, yeah. uh, and this is how like they kind of centralize things keep it all under their kind of umbrella um, but i think in general uh for us like what web3 and and kind of decentralization and identity management kind of come into play is that like you are the uh owner of your identity and the wallet that is associated with it and theoretically you should be able to have messages that communicate with anybody right whether it be an email address or an sms number or a facebook uh, messenger app right um, and I think that's kind of the cool part is that hopefully we can push for that kind of open framework where people can communicate freely because I think that's where uh, you know I don't think anyone has to pick and choose and be kind of dedicated to like one app or the other um, you know this is like something that a lot of folks played around with like 15 years ago where you you know you logged into one centralized messaging application and then you logged into all your apps uh, at once and it was really cool um, but I think today, now, like you know, we see what the world coming to is that you know everybody has a has a has a messaging app now, right? And mm -hmm. I, I personally have like 15 of them, and yeah. uh, I don't know why, right? And uh, I shouldn't. Um, so I think one of the things that we see uh, a builder coming on top of our infrastructure is to leverage our middleware to create a new user experience to federate, right? Um, mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, have the owner um, and the user be kind of the same. Um, because I think, you know, where we are today, like the walled gardens uh, shouldn't be, you know, shouldn't be a thing later in the future uh, if we're looking three to five years out. Um, and I think that's what we see from the power of decentralization um, and what that impacts from a user experience level. So. Mm. Okay. Looking forward to that. All right. Uh, yeah. Thank you guys for, for, for taking the time to, to join the panel. i um, really excited to see what you guys uh, will be doing and growing how, and how you'll be growing uh, over the next few years. All right. Thank you guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you.